Good afternoon. Uh, I guess we're going to start now. Is it all right to start? Okay. Um, we gave this talk at uh, ShmooCon this year, and we've updated it a little bit, and uh, designing and responding to target network attacks against the enterprise. Um, I'm Cygnus, and this is Presmike, and we're members of the Hacker Pimps. And, uh, yes, yes. And um, I, I have decided that I have a, a complete aversion to uh, buzzwords. So uh, if you find a buzzword or something of that nature that I can't back up with, like, real uh, technical speak, then uh, uh, find me and I'll buy you a drink. Uh, just one, though. And it's a drink of my – and here's the catch. It's a drink of my choice. <laughs> so, so be careful if you open your mouth. There's always a catch. Um, the other part of this is, is that we haven't really looked at these slides uh, since uh, the last time we presented them, and there might be some random things that are new, so bear with us if we look really confused. And this is not saying that we're lack, you know, just unmotivated. And, well, okay, maybe we are. But um, uh, really we're just lazy and extremely busy. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And our agenda, look at the context of what these attacks look like, the reconnaissance and design, how, how you start these things out. Uh, then uh, Pres Mike's going to go over the attack phase, and then I'm going to look at some uh, defense and response to these attacks after you find out that you're pwned and there's nothing else you can do about it. And then we're going to figure out some questions. Or, no, you're going to figure out questions, and then we're going to look really confused when we try to answer them. So this quote... Everybody can read, but uh, how does that make you feel? And what, one of the things that I really liked about this quote was, uh, was um, uh, this was sent in uh, February of 1999 in a book called Unrestricted Warfare that was produced by two Chinese colonels. So uh, it, it's no surprise that we're in the, the fate of where we are today. So built this nice little graph because I was looking at uh, how the information offensive works and, and thought about it. And governments have a lot more leeway than the rest of us mere mortals do. And some of the things that aren't exactly illegal are very legal for them and they have a very high impact. So this is completely about information warfare. Uh, when you get to a government level. Before then, they call it industrial espionage and, and uh, uh, business analysis. Even some marketing forms are, are akin to information warfare when you're looking at, at governments or uh, at, at businesses, rather. And then uh, business and society, uh, competitive intelligence is what they call it. So uh, for, for us mere mortals, again, a lot of the things that everyone else would do uh, are highly illegal. So not really sure you want to look at some of that. So uh, DDoSs are highly legal, not necessarily saying that uh, a government can do it. They are legal, but just not uh, the legal because you can get away with it. And that's what I'm saying is the definition of, of legal because there's nothing it really says that you can't other than internal policy. Um, targeted attacks right there in the middle. Uh, they border. really depends on your intent and who's doing it. And then competitive intelligence, it's contractor intel. You've got this guy that's been working with these guys forever, and then you turn around and, and somebody comes to you and says, hey, uh, tell me what I need to know to, to, to help uh, to get this contract or whatnot. Those are the types of things you look at. So um, what are the motivations? Uh, of course, money, um, uh, information to sell. It all comes back down to money. Um, more or less, always comes back down to money. In one form or another, there's going to be a transaction. So following the money when you're looking at these types of things, if you have access to that, is uh, also a good way to start tracking this. Um, automation likes to work, but the problem is, is is that us idiots called humans get in the way, and uh, then we screw it all up. So automation is good, but we can't always use it, so there's always this human element that, that gets in the swirl there. Um, traditional goals uh, back in the uh, mid-90s were to own a device, take it offline, and, ooh, wow, I'm leaked. Um, not anymore. Uh, today, the, uh, the uh, traditional goals of an attack are to own a device, uh, keep it uh, for as long as you can without the defenders of that device knowing that you own it. So that's completely different. Uh, it's a different paradigm shift. Um, and instead of tacking the technology, because everybody's aware of the IA, uh, uh, information assurance, and informa IT security, all these different things that are going through, and the technology is getting very difficult. 
to actually breach directly. Uh, and, you know, unless you're some interesting people that uh, get up here on stage and, and talk. Um, but most of the time it's going to be more difficult because the low-hanging fruit are actually the people in the organization. I can social engineer them. I can spoof them. I can, I can make them believe that I am the, the president of the Sandy, and they will believe it just because that's who I claim to be. So uh, the... The types of systems that they're looking for and the types of ways that they're doing this now are to influence a decision maker's perspective and what they're going to say about different things. Because not only can I take information from you to know what you know, I can also replace information to make you think you know something that's not true, something I want you to believe. So planning of data. So, uh, um, okay, I was told to hold the mic closer. Is that better? Okay, sorry. Um, who all was here for Sean's talk just a little bit ago? Because uh, that, that really... Yeah. Sean, you were here for your talk. That's, that's impressive. <laughs> I thought you were Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> In the bar and on stage at the same time. So, um, how do you use all this information? Because I was sitting watching his talk, and oddly enough, I've had about four chances to see his talk. This is the first time I've actually kept, caught any of it. And uh, it's a really good talk. Um, what do you do with this information? How do you use it? So uh, design this, uh, this uh, information operations. It's what I.O. stands for. Um, you gather the information, feeds information management, and then you have these two different uh, databases that you see uh, flying off this. The competitive Intel DB which, uh, database, which is your legal database, which that means if, the, if law enforcement catches you with this, you really can't get in trouble because you're just doing market research. That's all it is. No big deal. So then you have your, inf uh, your information offensive database uh, over here on the other side. That's the one that you don't tell anybody about, and you hire contractors in other countries to, to run. And you feed all this type of information if you're doing honeypots or if you're doing types of things like this, and you feed all that information into the, the red database. And you sit here and you trend on different things to find your opponent's weakness, your target's weakness. So you analyze all this data together, and it would be very interesting if you had a way as, uh, to get everyone in the entire organization to start inputting data into this database that's, that's no big deal, that you, you can admit you have, and then start correlating things back and forth in between these two databases. And then look at it in intelligence utilization and then figure out how all those different types of information apply. Like if you've got somebody coming out, uh, uh, take two pharmaceutical companies, I'm coming out with a new drug. Well, wonderful. I'm, I'm your competitor. Well, it's either I develop it or I turn around and I steal it from you. And then if I steal it from you, then, then uh, it's no big deal. I'll just modify it a little bit and it saves me a whole lot of money. And I'll charge the, uh, just a little bit less and I'll make money. So, again, money is the, uh, the end. Uh, here's another wonderful quote from Unrestricted Warfare. In the wake of expansion of mankind's imaginative powers and his ability to master technology, the, the battle space is being stretched to its limits. This is in 99. This is what makes this is so impressive, is, is, that, is, is that this is like almost eight years later, and we're looking at this, and we're like, wow, uh, it's everywhere. So if you take a look at the, uh, the other side of that, anybody seen the new Die Hard movie, the, the, the one that just came out? Who, how, how many like that? How many like that movie? Yeah, I, I liked it too because it was a constant explosion, and that's usually what happens when John McClane's in the room. So, um, uh, or this guy but for different reasons. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, um, moving on. Um, the, the idea was is that you know, the, this, this full-fledged attack on all the infrastructure reminded me of uh, just how simple it was in uh, Superman whenever they changed the walk and don't walk signs and just created mass panic and chaos within the traffic space. So you wake up one day and you realize all these things have become very, uh, very not nice anymore, things you take for granted. So the battle space isn't on a battlefield in some distant country. It's not on a, just a network. It's everywhere. And uh, that, that's what we're trying to get across. Anything can, can look at that. So you gather info. 
you know, open source web company, FCC, patents, uh, legal filings, any of the, uh, the uh, uh, stuff the SEC might make you file for uh, if you're a publicly traded company, uh, uh, internal knowledge suppliers, IS systems. Uh, you guys know how to gather this information. Gathering the information is not difficult. It's trending it and bringing intelligence out of the information. That's the most difficult part. So if we're going to do a network operation, what are some of the planning? Well, first off, you've got to have the right goal or you're not going to get anywhere, and the right target. Is your target like massive owners? Is your target to build? Is your target just to get this one thing? Is your target to even do more reconnaissance to figure out how you're going to launch another attack later on? So um, if you don't have the intelligence to do your goal, then you might need to back from that, look for some other goals to actually develop some more intelligence like... I want to go in and I want to get this file, or I want to get this specific plans or do design for equipment or whatnot. Well, I don't have enough intelligence for that, so I need to probe their network and look for things so that way I can actually build these attacks. Um, trade secrets, as I said, information, uh, foothold to future attacks, uh, attack design, who or what are you attacking, network systems they own, profiling their entire network. Know their, better, their network better than their admins know their network. So... Um, uh, types of people who work there, are they business-based users, are they analysts, are they the engineering type, uh, uh, how do you appeal to them, what makes them uh, you know, get all giddy inside and, and want to trust you, this is what you've got to find out. So uh, types of software, the line of business applications, is it custom, is it something that, that's widely exploitable, if it's custom, can you get a copy of it, can you start throwing some stuff in there, and Presmix can go into a lot of that. And what are their base? Are they looking at? Uh, are they Linux-based? Are they Unix? Are they mix, hybrid, or the the dirty Windows that everybody knows it loves? Um, your recon, same thing. We went through this. Everybody knows how to get this this publicly available data. And then know the business relationships, the order of battle, who reports to who, how they report when things get uh, when people get promoted. Uh, figure out where they go from there, so that way you can use that intelligence maybe to launch on another, uh, on another competitor, things of that nature. So profiling the people as well as the network, and that, that's, that's really where you got to start looking at it, start profiling the people. Uh, went backwards. Um, yeah, I kind of went through all this type of stuff, so we're just going to keep going. Except that last part, uh, uh, model for int uh, all points of entry not to exploit the easiest security hole. Because the easiest, they might not know about. Then again, they might, or it could be one of John's honeypots, and you really don't want to go there. You can go somewhere else. Uh, social recon, conferences, expos, bars, uh, so etc. and so forth. Uh, how many people here are trying to be socially engineered for uh, information for their day job? And it's just a question to think about when you're talking to these people and getting to know them. How much information are you really giving out? Um, org charts. We, we went through all this type of stuff. Help wanted, uh, great to put a mole in there somehow. Uh, email recon, uh, what's the email structure normally look like in their business? Sometimes you might have cribs like a company slogan or things like that. You have those cribs that relates back to cryptography. And then if you have those, you can uh, start to decrypt some things. There's all kinds of different things that you can do just by knowing how a, communi uh, how a company communicates back and forth and then also knowing their... Uh, uh, their their language and understanding the lingo inside of that because as a as a individual that's going to be doing this you might not know the the uh, specific terms and acronyms for that industry so you need to know it just as well as they do um, disguise it as spam uh, make it look like legitimate traffic things like that and we're going to keep going where was your slide your slide was in here somewhere wasn't it is it coming up ah there it is. <laughs> like I said, long time. Because I knew I was getting into his material. Yeah, we're real or well organized here. Um, all right, so the, the what Cygnus has just talked about is kind of the whole, like, you know, precursor to the actual attack. So what kind of things do you have to keep in mind? What do you have to worry about? Um, what information do you need before you actually go ahead and, and launch your attack? Um, so, this is a quote from, you guys can read it, you guys know where it's from when it was uh, <coughs> quoted. But basically, um, targeted attacks are starting to become more common. Uh, in the past, you used to have 
you know, just vulnerable services, you know, there's DCOM, whatever, uh, and you do these mass exploitations across the Internet and own 20,000 machines with a worm or whatever. Um, but, you know, people are starting to use firewalls at home. They have routers at NAT. You, know, you have, there's, there's a lot smaller attack service, uh, surface in a way. And so now you've got to actually sometimes use some intelligence when you're attacking a, a, a host at this point. Um, so the easiest way, well, <laughs> the easiest way to get onto a network is through email. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, we recently have done some testing of this, and um, we, what, 2,400 users? 24. We, we tested, okay, so we did a test of about 2,400 users, and 42% uh, clicked a link from somebody who they did not know, and, but, I mean, we took like 10 minutes, whipped it up, made this, like, email look sort of kind of legit, like it's not really even all that well put together, and uh, 42% success rate. Um, and this is in, like, an organization that has, like, a pretty decent, like, annual, like, training plan for this stuff. Like, this is, this is not, like, just your average, like, you know, like, company out here where, like, you, you never hear about, like, security and stuff. This is a decently well-trained workforce. So... And, and to add to that, if you, uh, uh, to think about how uh, involved people are in the work, one of the phone numbers for the contact on this was at 857 uh, 897-5309, uh, and uh, no one caught it. Yeah. Uh, they never caught it. They're like, we called the number, it's disconnected. Yeah. Uh, so no one caught it. So they're, they're not looking for this at all. They're not looking for these things. So, so I kind of just shot myself in the foot by telling you that story, because we just, this is something like we just recently did, but... Like, if you actually wanted to add some intelligence to your email attack, which I just told you, you don't even have to do. I mean, literally, you can say, hey, check out this news site and put a link to a URL that looks like it goes to a news site, and everybody and their mother will click it. But if you actually want to, like, fly in under the radar a little bit, um, you know, think about who you're, like, what type of company you're going after, what type of organization you're going after. And then, you know, like, you're obviously going to have a list of email addresses. You know, who are the people that you're sending these emails to? Is it... You know, if it's highly technical people, maybe you have to put some thought into it. Like, don't just, you know, be stupid and make some, you know, cheesy email up. You know, you got to put some thought into it. Know your audience. Um, you know, like, one of the things about uh, the admin assistants, right? Like, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I want to send an email to, you know, the CEO or the COO because they have all this access and, you know, they probably have, you know, cool stuff that I'd want to see. But, I mean, like, their admin assistant is... Like, you know, some hot blonde that makes, you know, 20 grand a year and sits there and all she does is read and respond to email. Like, that's a much easier way to get to that same, like, information because she's got access to everything he has access to because she is his right-hand man. So keep that sort of stuff in mind. Um, all right, so a couple of different things. I mean, obviously, you guys know all about uh, email, um, but um, emails with attachments, uh, there's been a whole flurry of stuff since we like gave this talk where, um, I mean, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, all these different applications have all kinds of buffer overflows all throughout them. And it's like every other month when there's some new O-Day in Word or Excel or Adobe Acrobat or whatever, um, you know, just go pay some, some smart kid to find one and, yes. Yeah, so people are really stupid at work. I mean, that's <laughs> pretty much what he just said. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I'm too lazy to drive out to the company. And, but yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. That that type of stuff works. I'm, I I want to be able to do this for my house, so so. Um, but yeah, you can totally do the USB, you know, the auto auto run stuff. Um, but. Um, so the the emails with the attachments, I mean that's the easiest way to get a piece of mail code on a on a on a box right now. Um, find a vulnerability in some you know commonly used uh, uh, application at the at the office. It doesn't even have to be Word. Like if you know that they're a big time, um, say they're a big time like contracting firm that that deals with a lot of um, you know building design plans. Like go figure out what software they're using. You can pretty probably pretty easily find some buffer overflow in that application and send them, you know, here's a new floor plan for building X and, you know, somebody's going to open it up and, and, you know, you drop your code that way. Um, phishing emails, like I said, Jesus Christ, this is really easy. Um, man, like 42%, okay? Like, just keep that in mind. Like, just send it to a couple of people and you're going to get somebody. Um, so... I mean, here's just to illustrate what I just said. I mean, the, the PowerPoint, the Excel, all these Word, uh, you know, all these Office formats um, have recently had a ton of problems in them. I'm sure there's more that haven't been found yet. Use those uh, if you want to get onto the network. Um, so website attacks. Um, it's funny because I just put together a briefing for some of my management the other day, and um, I was going through just a bunch of like like a bunch of our cases. And um, like I would say, like seventy, eighty percent of the stuff that we work on is like lately as website stuff. So somebody visits, you know, such and such a website, and there's some iframe with some stupid, obfuscated Java code that's triple encoded and drops some 1996 like O day on your box. Like, like it's really stupid because they go to all this trouble to obfuscate like how their JavaScript drops the thing, but then they use some cheesy like ninety six like, you know, exploit. But I mean there's a lot of good exploits out there. There's a lot of good stuff. Like there's there's a new one in what, Adobe from last week, right? So instead of, you know, using some old ass exploit, use something new and uh obfuscated JavaScript's a pain in the ass and it's gonna take some people some time to find it. And your IDS isn't going to stop it. So, um, and then, um, sorry, I'm reading my slides real quick. <laughs> All right. So, um, and then just taking into like account of like where you're going after, right? So, if you know the people, you know the audience. Um, you know, make your attack fit. So, um, like we have all the time, where uh, like where we work, where. Um, like there's some obvious places people that I work with are going to be surfing. And so if you go and you know where they're going to be surfing, you know that maybe they do research on this type of stuff, you know, if they're if they're if they're a financial industry, they're going to be looking at, you know, maybe financial information. There's a couple like main sites everybody in that company is going to hit. Go hack one of those sites, you know, with some stupid, you know, SQL injection, something easy. Billy will tell you how to do it next. <laughs> so listen to Billy's talk and then use that for my talk. But um, you know, go go on one of these sites and then you know have your own have your exploit uh, host up there. You don't even have to like trick them into going to a, like some site that you do through a phishing email. They're just going to go there by themselves. So I keep that in mind. Um, the financial info, like this, is just kind of a random idea. Um, but you know, maybe uh, you know how like a lot of companies like they have their information out and they'll say, hey, we had our quarterly stock meeting and here's the stuff. And if you want to download the audio file. You can hear everything that we talked about, yada, yada, yada. Well, maybe your audio file requires some special codec, and it just so happens to be a Trojan backdoor. Um, so the backdoor, like talking a little bit about like if you were to build your own custom backdoor, like there's no need to make it a rootkit. I mean, you can if you want, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter. No, nobody's going to find it because uh, you wrote it yourself, hopefully. Um, just make it blend in. Like, there's a couple things to keep in mind, right? So, AV is not going to detect it because you're putting it together yourself. Um, hopefully, you and a couple of friends are just going to like sit down and bang it out. Um, so, don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about AV. Um, all you have to worry about is, you know, what is the one or two IDS guys that work at that company going to see? Like, what network data is this thing going to generate? Um, and that's what you really got to worry about. Um, so, uh, we'll go into that in a second, but. Like timestamps are like 
so first thing you're going to do in, in an instant response situation, so say somebody does find out that this box has been compromised because they finally, after three days, figured out your JavaScript, assholes. And uh, they get on the box, and like, if you change all the timestamps, you do a couple like little simple things, it's really going to slow down the investigation. And like, depending upon what you're after, this, you have to keep in mind, this is a targeted attack. This is not me building a botnet, and I want it to be around for four months. This is, I want to get on the box, and I want to steal a bunch of data, and I'm leaving. Like, as soon as I get on, I'm out the door in like, eight hours. And most places, like, even good instant response teams are going to have a hard time tracking on a machine in eight hours. So, you know, know what you're going in for, get on the box, get your shit, and get out. Next. So, communication. So, here's kind of what I was talking about. The best chance that your the security team at the company that you're breaking into is going to have is at the network level. Um, so, make your communications blend in. Don't do some stupid, like, weird port. Don't do anything um, that just is completely out of profile for the network. Um, if you want to do it through DNS, talk to Dan. He's not here. He's at TourCon because... Well, we know why he's, why Turcon. Yeah. Anyways, um, you know, use use protocols that are already in use on the network. Um, don't don't do anything crazy, and maybe take advantage of like SSL and just you know it's encryption and you don't have to write it. So take advantage of stuff that. Um, hey Billy, what's up? Way to be on time. Um, so, like, like, Google has this really cool thing called Gmail, and um, there's, like, an HTTPS version of it, and it's got this cool little, like, chat feature, right? So, you could enable real-time communication with your back door through Google Chat, and it blends in. It looks like somebody's just checking their email, and it's encrypted. So, there's really no good way of detecting that at the network level, and that's all that you should be concerned about. Um, so... If you are wanting to keep this box owned and you're wanting to keep your, your piece of malware around for a little while, um, you'd want to add some anti-reversing stuff into it um, and some virtual machine detection. There's a lot of good sites out there. Use Google or click that link and uh, talk about how to detect uh, You know, if you're running in a virtual environment or whatnot. There's, they actually have the code there. You just like copy and paste. You don't even have to do anything. Um, so the only real uh, alternative to that is you know, using some obscure virtualization technology or just using like SANNETs, which Joe Stewart talked about like a year and a half ago. Um, but So I have a malware guy on my team, and he does like reversing, and um, this shit down here at the bottom really annoys the hell out of him. So if you use your own custom, impact, you know, custom packer, you encrypt your strings, and, uh, you know, maybe you add a bunch of junk code, you're really going to drive him insane. So, you know, like most companies aren't going to have that ability in-house. So what they're going to do is they're going to have, you know, they're just going to ship it off to Symantec. And Symantec's got some pretty good reversers. But like I said, your goal is to be on the box for about eight hours. So um, anything you can do to slow down the responders. Uh, control of the back door. We already went into some of this, but... Um, you can have it just, you know, what we what we call beacon, which is, is just have your back door call out to some external something, whether it's a DNS server, uh, you know, and it's going to pull, you know, I, like a lot of the back doors that we've seen, um, they don't have like this super huge like functionality, like it's like six options, you know, it's one through six, and um, you know that's all that they really need to really get what they need done. So you don't have to have some some crazy, like, instructions, you know, like, you can do a lot of this through, like, really small uh, amounts of traffic. So you can beacon out to a website and, and uh, pull uh, some command off that site, and it could be anything, right? Like, it's a regular HTML page, but your bot knows what to look for. So it could just be a, a value statement in, in Java, and that's the control, uh, command and control for the bot. Um, it could be through DNS, it could be through email. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer and Tor, uh, so there's some malware out there that already does this. It's, I mean, it, it's starting to be done, so, I mean, you can always leverage some of that um, that's out there. It makes it really, really hard to track. What's that? 
Not yet. Not yet. So IRC, but IRC, well, IRC is kind of easy to detect. Right. Okay. So, yeah, but, I mean, the, the idea of this is, is just to throw a couple of ideas out there. There's a million, billion different ways. Like, talk to Sean if you want to get another idea. Like, there's a lot of different ways to control these bots. And, you, like, like I was telling somebody else earlier that, like, what if you were to do it through... Um, well, never mind, I'm not going to throw that out there. Never mind. <laughs> there's a lot of good ideas out there, though. Um, so... To go into the beaconing thing, like this is something that we're starting to see somewhat, uh, somewhat commonly actually, where the bot just goes down and it checks a website and it. I'm the mic killer. Okay, so beaconing, um, HTTP, like have a website that has a specific value somewhere on the site, like I already said. Uh, but even better, make it HTTPS, and then it makes it even harder for the net defenders to figure out what's going on. Um, one caveat for that, so we've seen this occasionally, and like it's really, really obvious. Um, how many people check their email at 3 a.m. while they're at work? So implement like some sleep functionality into your back door. If you're gonna if you're gonna code this thing up, like take the extra step and tell it to go to sleep whenever normal people aren't at work. Um, because this stuff is really easy. Like it stands out like a sore thumb. Like nobody's on Gmail chat at 3 a.m. when they're not at their desk. So um, just make sure that you use some common sense when you're coding this stuff, and it's going to give you the added amount of time that you need to get what you're looking for. DNS. Um, Talk to Dan and email something that we kicked around. I'm not completely sure that I like the idea as much, but you can look at like headers and emails for command and control. You could have there's all sorts of stuff that you could do in there. Um, there's definitely some. The only problem with the email, in, in my opinion, is you've got some logs of it, right? So it's sitting in a couple different mail servers as it bounces around, and um, so like using the regular internal email system is kind of questionable. Like there's going to be some evidence left behind, and people could put back together what you're doing. Webmail is pretty brilliant though, because you know who yeah. the people that are looking. Right. Yeah. So things like that, and you can even do like value statements in these. You know, page ID, like in the in the like in the RSS statement, so that you can you can actually get like have the URL have different values in it, so that the values in the URL can actually be used for uh, for command and control. Um, yep, talked about that. Uh, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. So some of the automated stuff. So as you're building this, uh, some functions to just. Keep in mind, you don't have to implement these. You don't have to implement any of these. And, but some of these things that might make your job a little bit easier uh, to have, like, as soon as the piece of malware drops in the box, it can go out and do a bunch of stuff so that by the time you figure out you've owned somebody and you're connecting in, there's already a bunch of files that are sitting around ready for you to exfiltrate off-site or maybe they've just been emailed off as an attachment through Gmail or whatever you're using for your command and control. Um, you know, basic stuff, steal, uh, steal information about the network that you're on. You can do some little bit of, like, local recon just through the commands that are built into Windows. Um, and then looking at, you know, trying to steal the SAM file. You want to crack the local admin password and then use it to touch all the other boxes on the network because people are lazy and it'll probably be the same everywhere. Um, you can do uh, some string searches. This is kind of more the advanced stuff that... We haven't really seen much of, but it wouldn't be that hard to do. Is add some functionality where it just uh, does some auto uh, searches through uh, files for different values. I, actually, I guess we have seen some of this, but 
it's not that common uh, at this point, unless it's a like World of Warcraft like login stealer, which whatever. Um, you can always try to load up a bunch of uh, exploits that uh, some of the most you know recent exploits that you can auto own a bunch of boxes nearby, uh, and then if you're if you're not going to steal the password, maybe um, you could at least try a dictionary attack against it on the local system. <laughs> so, um, I didn't realize I had this many slides. Jesus. All right, so here's where the, like, the real functionality you get out of your, your reverse out of your back door is like actually implementing some sort of reverse shell. Because a lot of the stuff that we see right now, and it seems to work really well, is you have, like I said earlier, you have about six main functions. One of those functions is to establish you know, a reverse shell back to the actual attacker. And that's when he can do whatever he wants. Um, so this is where you can move uh, new files, new tools onto the system. You can control, you can do searches, you can pull documents off, you can exfiltrate stuff. Billy's leaving. Bastard. Um, you can use, like I said, I mean earlier, you can use like existing systems to exfiltrate files. So, you know, zip up a bunch of shit and then upload it to Gmail and like send it off to yourself. It wasn't as long as I thought. Here you go. We never know when to end. Um, I've, I've had a couple more beers since I got up here last time, so this is going to be interesting. Before I get started in this part, I want to know um, who thinks they're safe, who knows they're owned. Wow, so everybody's on the fence. So what are you going to do about it? Uh, you're, the, the, you're like the upper like 97% of the world, so, so you, you don't get to vote. That's your job. If it didn't, I'd be worried. Anyway, anyway. Right, right, right. Other, other than Sean, is anyone else worried? Well, the thing is, though, is, is that what we're saying is make sure that it's not detected. Blends in with what the current traffic that's going on. So you're not going to find it. You don't know what you don't know, and your IDS is not going to find it. Neither are your analysts. So you, there, there, there is hope, and, and that's what we're getting into. So how have I been compromised? Um, now these I really haven't looked at in a long time. I spent a lot of time looking at the beginning, but not at the end. So I'm winging the the complete rest of this. Um, it's not impossible to own any network whatsoever. It's just uh, some are more difficult than others. And uh, Schneier brought up a good point. Uh, you don't have to be the most secure in the world. You just have to be more secure than your neighbor. You just have to run faster than your friend when the bear's after you. So it's the same principle here. Uh, or as it was put this morning, you just have to outrun that cruise missile. So. Um, IDS, firewalls, the standard, uh, the standard things that you would see, um, usual suspects. So uh, assume you're owned at all times and be ultra paranoid uh, as much as your management will let you. Um, have a re incident response team. If you don't, um, shame on you. And if you don't have the ability to implement it, as an administrator, educate yourself in basic triage so you have a clue about what to do. NIST has some wonderful documents, and they just released uh, like NIST 300 or something like that. It, it's one of the it, it's one of their documents on nothing but incident response. They had it in the uh, the NIST handbook, but they sucked it out and built their entire own publication about uh, about um, uh, incident response. So look there if you have some questions. That gives you the theory, the tools. Start with sys internal tools, things like that. I think I get into that, so I might get a little bit ahead. But forgive me. Excuse me. Uh, train your users. Uh, it won't. Even if you do, it won't really matter, but you should try anyways. It, this, this is true. It, it's an exercise in futility, but if you don't do it, then you're not doing everything you can. Um, 
Uh, I think in my uh, bio for ShmooCon, it said the best way to deal with users was with duct tape, a hula hoop, and a uh, bag of Oreos. Or was it a wolf at ball bat? Something like that. Oreos were for me. Um, so teach them the dangers. And if you have to teach them by a real-world test, uh, we're not the first group to start doing this to our users. A lot of other agencies have done this, and we took a cue from them. This is not something that's crazy, ultra-secret. Uh, test your user's ability to, to, to do this because they are the first line of defense when it comes to any attack on your network. Because as stated in the beginning, we're not hacking the network anymore as an attacker. We're, taking, we're going after the people. We've evolved to go after the people, not the technology anymore. You are the target, not the technology. So just because you bought this new whiz-bang firewall or whatnot, then uh, uh, doesn't mean that you're going to be protected no matter what the salesman said. Um, train and spot suspicious emails. Uh, always validate if you're uh, if they think it's fishy, then it probably is. Follow it up with a phone call, uh, something in that nature. Report it to security, some along those lines. You guys know what to tell them. You just got to get management support to get you in front of them to tell them the right things. Um, digitally sign. Uh, uh, cryptographically is a better word. Uh, cryptographically sign uh, emails, uh, validate the recipients, all internals at least. Um, employee spoofing to each other can't, and that way it gets in the user in the mindset of your users and your employees that if it's an internal mail, it looks like it's supposed to be, then it better be signed, and if it's not, then I need to 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 86 it. So. Uh, consider dis, uh, disallowing HTML email. Uh, it, I'm not saying not use Outlook. I just say get rid of HTML email. It is the bane of, of most people's existence. Marketing is going to fight you. HR is going to fight you. Uh, and the little secretary that's been there since she was 14 is going to fight you because she likes her flower background on her email. Get rid of it. It is nothing but a waste, and it's also going to cut down in your spam, because have you ever seen an HTML email converted down into text? No one can read it unless they're us, because it just looks like pure HTML, and no one else is going to look at it. There'll be a help desk ticket on it for you to come read it to them. Um, uh, deny email that's spoofed. Uh, uh, not always accurate, but talk to Dan about some more DNS stuff. If you see a technology in here, and you know somebody else is an expert about it, don't ask us. Ask, ask them. Uh, we, we don't claim to know it, and we learn from them as well. So uh, uh, real-time blacklists are really good. If you don't have AV and spam filtering, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Just like you have, there, there's absolutely nothing I can do to help you. I mean, <laughs> just, just, no. I, I don't even want to talk to you if you don't have, if you don't have that. Uh, it, it it might not work for you because I don't use antivirus or things like that because I mean I deal with malware every day it's going to destroy my work but uh, but um, uh, you need it for your users. Battle. Any vendors here who want to pay us to answer this question? <laughs> <laughs> or buy us a beer at least at the minimum. Just checking. Um, I mean, the the two out there that seem to be uh, the most popular: Surf Control and and what's um, um, Surf Surf Control. WebSense. Web thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so well, they're really yeah. popular together now. <laughs> um, <laughs> They seem to have the market corner, and they seem to do a pretty good job. So, Popularity. but I, I don't, I, I don't sit behind either of them, so I don't, I can't really speak to their. Expert, go kill. So, uh, kill with questions, not with force, because he's bigger than you are. I guarantee it. Um, uh, so, um, disallowing regular users to download pack DXCs. And these might see, be some of the things that you might want to look at whenever you're in the middle of choosing a, a content filtering solution. Um, uh, yeah, you can read. It's just uh, uh, 
Tipping Point, uh, we're a big fan of Tipping Point. Uh, we're not here to pimp anybody's product. It's just it, it works, and that, that's it. And I don't want to get into the, to all the other thing, controversy around all these different products, but it has the ability to prevent some of the stuff. And as a defender, I really don't care who gives me the technology. I just, as long as it works, I really don't give a shit. I just want it to work. Um, detecting the compromise. Um, Real-time signatures, they might detect a targeted attack, especially if they're using something from way back when, but if it's targeted, they're not going to. They're going to write all their own custom stuff. Uh, the thing is, is in a targeted attack, you are not going to have any signatures. None of your automation is going to help. The only thing that can help you is knowing the behavior of a network and historical analysis. That's the only thing that's going to help you. Or having users come up and tell you something's wrong. Yes? Usually a sim. Sim's going to work. You can, you can go with, with any of the big leaders of sims. Uh, just because we chose one product over another does, doesn't mean anything. It's just that's what they, it just works for us best. Well, one of the things, um, so there's, there's a bunch of different sims out there, right? But one of the, the, the biggest problem with sims is Sorry, I should, I should stand up. Is do you have good data that you're feeding the sim? Like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, if you don't if you don't have good data, it doesn't matter what sim you've chosen. Um, and having having access to um, you know maybe every uh, HTTP header that comes into your into your building or network or whatever, and having all the email headers that come in so that you can go back and say. Hey, we, we see that this one person received this email, and um, we want to know where else it went. So you can then say, oh, well, we can go back to the sim. Instead of having to go to the Exchange admin and say, hey, dude, can you go through and start checking, you can actually go, then go look in your sim. So I don't really care what sim you use, but having good logging at the network level really, really helps uh, and really speeds up that process for you know the incident response team and the the you know, the intrusion detection team or whatever. But, you know, so make sure that you have, I mean, there's a lot of um, really good open source products. Um, we use Bro IDS extensively. It's great. It's free. Um, and there's all kinds of um, different modules for it, for DNS, for, um, for HTTP, for email. And you can capture all this stuff and then throw it into a sim and keep it there and then use it kind of as a network forensic tool. I mean, it's not going to have full content, but it gets you it gets you to a level where you can actually start the investigation. Network forensic sounds like a good name for a company, doesn't it? I, I think, I think yeah. somebody's got that. Okay. <laughs> so the, the vendors for, for some of these sims, the two big ones are Net Forensics and ArcSight. And, and for one reason or the other, I'm ArcSight partial. And uh, that, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, uh, dumb luck. Users every now and again will have a stroke of genius. Maybe they had an extra shot in their double mocha latte with skim or something of that nature when they were coming into the office. Who knows? Whatever it is, they got a stroke of luck and they realized something was wrong. And the thing is that you've got to look at as a security person or as an administrator is that if you're lucky enough to just be dedicated to security. If not, you know, as an administrator, that your people know when they see something wrong, get a hold of you uh, to tell you what it is. Um, um, let's see, yeah, all this type of stuff. Account mysteriously locked out. That, that's an interesting one. But how many people actually see a brute force attempt on an account anymore today? Well, but... The, the, Sean, you don't count. You don't count. Yeah, but you... Right, right, but you're not going to see that from the internal network. You're not going to see somebody's AD account get locked out, typically, because they're going to pull, the, pull it down and crack it offline. Yeah, but that's because you offered free porn. <laughs> well... That's their own damn fault for running OWA. <laughs> That's exactly their own damn fault. Yes, thank you. Um, so, 
So, so clean up. Uh, by the way, don't run OWA. If you do, make sure you're doing it through like Citrix or something else that's a little bit more. Just protective. don't do it. Yeah, that's even better. It's just like abstain <laughs> completely. It's like you know, be an OWA virgin. That that needs to be the slogan of your IA per, uh, of your IA campaign. Um, so clean up uh, corporate incident response team a CERT or a CERT emergency response. We typically shy away from the emergency response because that can mean anything, but we're looking at massive security incidents. Hey, Rattle, you got something for us? Anyway, uh, experience counts. Make sure your people are trained the, the best that you possibly can and that uh, they get everything they need to be able to do their job because they're the only ones that are going to be able to tell you're owned and how to clean up for them when you're done. Um, uh, Time until detection is critical, things like that. So, uh, procedures. Uh, we're going to take a couple minutes, right, because we were late starting. Oh, well, okay. Well, we'll go ahead and hurry up. Decius can wait. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I see Billy's next, right? No, it's Decius, then Billy. Oh, well, you can wait. So, <laughs> uh, Along with making sure they're well-staffed, well-manned, and well-funded, uh, you have to make sure that they have the uh, piece of paper from the CEO or uh, CIO that says, hey, I can come pull your crap offline anytime I want to, or I can do whatever I want to as long as I have a valid incident. They need to have um, interfaces to law enforcement, and Sean like, harped on this for, what was it, like eight slides? And uh, eight of the 61? 63, oh, my bad. So he, he went through this so law enforcement um, interaction. You've got to be able to be prepared for that, especially if you're looking at recovering monetary damages or, or uh, accumulating monetary damages because uh, same thing, if you get in a car accident, you don't get a police report, your insurance doesn't pay. Same thing goes along with this. So look at that and it, same type of stuff. Oh, and uh, be sure you know how to handle evidence correctly because if you don't, if you get a good forensic lawyer on the other side, you will lose. Um, and I'm not talking about the, the attacker's forensic lawyer. I'm talking about the insurance's forensic lawyer. Because if you have a huge policy and you try to file on that, they might look at the, the way the cost of taking you to court and fighting this rather than paying it out. So, so just make sure everything's right and it'll work out a lot better. Um, locating compromised machines, uh, backdoor associated files, uh, method of communication, uh, lab environment, VM. Too many things detect VM. Get a GOAT system. Use something like Core Restore. Um, don't know where it is? Search Core Restore. One word. Google. It's your friend. Talk to Johnny if you don't know how to use Google. Um, reverse engineer it. Um, as, you, as he said, uh, this can because headaches. If you have reverse engineers, leave them alone. Get them what they need and leave them alone. Don't badger the reverse engineer because they, they are very, very busy. Yeah, they're special people. Yeah, that's the best way to put it. They're special people. Um, hash the malware and then you can need to find a tool to, to be able to search for those hashes all across the network uh, because if you know you've got the hash, then you can search for it and find your other compromised machines. Typically, though... If you see it once, you're not going to see it again. And if you, so, so all it's going to do is protect you from that one instance because you're never going to see a repeated attack. If you do, then that, that's an anomaly that you need to investigate. So there's also a cool, uh, cool tool called MD5 Deep, which will do, sorry, which will do, thanks. It's funny, it's twice. Uh, it'll, so it'll do like partial hashes. So it'll go through and it'll it'll break up the executable into chunks, or whatever you've got, and hash each chunk. So um, a lot of times these malware authors, what they'll do right now is they'll change a few bytes here and there. Um, but you can actually go through and say, well, this this executable is like 91% the same as this other executable. Well, that's good enough. Like you know that you've got the same thing, and all they've done is try to like. Uh, change it just enough to beat a AV signature or to beat, you know, a in case enterprise uh, hash value. So you can you can take it to the next step and really look at to see if, if executables are very close to each other as well. 
recovery, triage, block your IPs, point of infection, you know, at your border router. If you don't have the infrastructure set up to respond to these attacks, then shame on you, quit, go away. Set up the infrastructure first because this is what you have to deal with. Uh, black hole domain names, if you know that they're using dynamic DNS to a specific domain name, black hole it, get it out of your system. Uh, you can even redirect those black holes to a Sean HoneyNet, and that's what we're going to call it from now on. Um, uh, develop IPS signatures to detect it or block it in the future, IDS to, to see it. If you can't develop signatures, shame on you. It's not difficult. They have all the stuff out there on their, on their site to do it. So uh, the bit hardest part is defining something in the malware you see that you can get a, posit a high uh, uh, positive uh, uh, fire rate on. That's the hardest part is finding that one thing that's different. Um, uh, patch for the exploited. Yeah, you should be doing that already. Uh, everybody hates Patch Tuesday. Uh, conclusions, and we have some. Uh, difficult to detect, prevent. O-Day is not necessary, but can be helpful. You don't have to have an O-Day to do this. Only stupid users. And, uh, and, and I'll, say that I'll take that to my grave. Um, let's see. Yeah, you see this. And, and those, those are the conclusions. So... There's the contact. Press Mike is completely anonymous, but I don't mind giving you the email, my email address, uh, if you have any questions. Um, the other uh, port, uh, the other link that's down here is a podcast that uh, went over with uh, uh, Information Warfare uh, uh, Group and uh, something I did with them, uh, specifically about Information Warfare and some of the things that you see in the site today. So it's about a 15-minute thing. So. It's just more into the, to the first section. So that's all we've got. So what questions do you have? None. Okay. You done? Uh, yeah. SIM is Security Information Manager. And the idea is you have... Uh, uh, you have Bro, you have like Lancope, you have... Um, it's a big database of all your security events. So yeah. IDS traffic goes in there. Firewall logs can go in there. Um, you know your event logs from your your uh, systems can go in there, and it's all put into a database. And then you can correlate that information based on times and whatnot. The key point is is that it's normalized into a certain format, so it's easily searchable, and, and it's easily data mined. And that's the point is that there's, there's normalization in, in that, so you can work on it. So, Sam. All right. Good open source SIM. That's a good, sounds like a good project to me, not a good answer. Do you know of any, does anybody know of good open source SIM? Sean, come on. Well, one thing I also have to say, if you decide to buy a SIM and you don't have somebody looking at it and monitoring it, you're wasting your money. Don't use it because all you're going to do is give yourself another headache of why you can't get your job done. So, all right, that's a wrap.